This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. Well, good evening, everybody, and welcome to uh, our next uh, uh, presentation that comes from the UC Davis Behavioral Health Center of Excellence, uh, a center that was established in conjunction with uh, uh, Senator Daryl Steinberg to advance the science and caring of uh, mental health in California. Uh, two centers were established, one in, at UC Davis and one at UCLA, and uh, I'm the lead dean for the UC Davis Center, and uh, uh, I'm really pleased that we were able to get Dr. Cam Carter to be the uh, director of our Behavioral Center of Excellence. Uh, it's up to me to introduce uh, Dr. Carter to you <clears throat> this evening. Many of you know Dr. Carter. Uh, I've been accused of reading curriculum vitae that sound more like obituaries than uh, introductions, and so uh, that would happen with Dr. Carter, and I'm going to avoid that uh, because he has had such a fantastic career, and we're Really pleased to have him here at Davis. I thought I would just make uh, two comments about uh, Dr. Carter. First of all, he really exemplifies disciplinary excellence. He's a fantastic uh, psychiatrist and, uh, and neuro, neuroscientist. Um, uh, he sees patients. He does research. Uh, and he really has had quite a remarkable impact nationally. I was reading one of his uh, recent articles in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. The, that journal is our premier, or one of our premier life sciences journals in the United States. And in this article, he discusses in a fairly eloquent fashion uh, not only the uh, psychosis aspects of schizophrenia, but also the remarkable cognitive decline that patients with schizophrenia often suffer from. Some of you may remember that being a point in A Beautiful Mind, uh, the movie, uh, and, and other uh, uh, case histories that you know about. Um, but this is an elegant editorial which really goes into that, but something that he's allowed me to be part of with him is that we're beginning to have the tools now that have emerged from the National Brain Initiative to modulate uh, how our brain works, and in particularly <clears throat> modulate some of the cognitive changes that happen, uh, just as we are going to be able to modulate some of the behavioral aspects of other uh, mental health disorders, such as obsessive compulsive uh, disorders, et cetera. So it really uh, was a pleasure for me to read this uh, elegant and eloquent, uh, just published uh, editorial that uh, demonstrated both Dr. Carter's uh, in-depth expertise, but also his ability to communicate effectively, which I'll, I think you'll see tonight. The other aspect of Dr. Carter's career here at Davis is how he's taken his disciplinary excellence and built these remarkable teams of individuals. And his teams that he works with, uh, that he leads, really go all the way from uh, the basic sciences, for example, his role in the Center for Neuroscience as the director of the Center for Neuroscience, um, which has now an additional, what we call, translational impact of that center, that is, taking some of the advances from the laboratory and beginning to see how it might change human health, all the way to clinical research, which he's done across the street in our imaging center, uh, and which he's done so effectively with many of his uh, bright junior colleagues to do cutting-edge clinical trials that show that, in fact, uh, early detection and early intervention uh, for psychoses can result in remarkable changes uh, in the clinical uh, trajectory of primarily young people with early diagnosis of psychosis. So uh, CAM's the entire package. Uh, he's, he's, he's excellent in his own discipline, but he works across disciplines with so many other people. Uh, he even knows how to work with a dean, which uh, most people would say is almost impossible. Uh, and so we're very grateful for uh, Cam to uh, join us tonight and give us some of his uh, thoughts on brain research and, and where some of the new discoveries and breakthroughs are happening at UC Davis. Dr. Carter. All right, well, thank you very much, Fred, for that very, very nice introduction. Uh, we have the uh, Behavioral Health Center sign here tonight, and I'm going to spend a little bit of time uh, talking to you about what the Behavioral Health Center is about as we sort of work uh, our way through the talk. Um, 
Uh, and uh, uh, and as, as Fred mentioned, this is part of an ongoing lecture series. Uh, Daryl gave the first one a couple of months ago. Um, I get to give the, the second one with a little emphasis on neuroscience. Um, but I'll explain a little bit more about um, how the behavioral health center is sort of bigger than one particular area, either kind of in the, the, the spectrum, the range of mental health research, and also, I think, the, the various areas, the departments, the, the colleges here at the School of Medicine uh, at, at the University of California, Davis, and uh, try to put it all in a bit of a, a context for you. So what I'm going to talk about today, though, there's sort of several points here. The first is that I want to start because this is, I, I, you know, pr primarily I, I see some daunting figures in the audience who already know a lot about this area, but um, this is mainly a public talk, and so I've prepared this talk largely for, for the general public. And I'm going to start with um, a... Uh, a kind of little, little bit of an overview of a 20, 21st century uh, understanding of the structure and function of the brain, just to give you a sense of the, the, the beautiful complexity and uh, uh, the deep vulnerability that, uh, that, the, that the human brain has and how it's easy to understand how developmental perturbations in, in this amazing organ can lead to the whole variety of different mental disorders and developmental disorders that uh, I think those of you that are here from, from the general public are most interested in. I'll also talk a little bit about neurotechnology, the, the amazing role that technology, the sort of engineering of studying the brain is playing in opening up all sorts of possibilities, first for understanding the healthy human brain, but also for uh, understanding um, its disorders, and, and I think even more importantly, providing new avenues for actually intervening and changing and improving and, re and remediating the function of the brain. Um, and then I'm going to talk about behavioral health center stuff. Um, some of the things that we have done as a hint, as a center in the few months that we've been up and running, including a description of uh, the pilot grant awards that we've um, uh, awarded. Uh, with the funds that were provided for us, which spanned the whole range from very basic discovery and tool development all the way through clinical neuroscience, treatment and services research, and also, uh, to some degree, how we can take that knowledge and, and provide it in a way that's useful for the people that make decisions about our healthcare system and about public policy in mental health. Um, so that's our pilot grant awards and also the brain stim grants. And I'll give you some examples because, again, I want, want to give you a chance to kind of learn more about the science that's happening at Davis, um, the you know, remarkable technology that's, that's being used, and the incredible people that are doing this research. And then I'll end with a description of a new center that I think um, uh, Dean Myers alluded to uh, that's housed at the Center for Neuroscience but involves uh, the Mind Institute uh, and people from various schools and colleges across the campus. That's a kind of big science center um, focused on taking our basic understanding of brain development and applying it uh, uh, to, to uh, really test some very novel ideas about what causes uh, schizophrenia and other serious mental disorders and how we might go about treating it. So I'm going to start by showing you this beautiful picture here of a neuron. So our brain is made up of 100 billion of these. In fact, um, there's an interesting uh, fact that I did want to share with you, and that is that um, uh, men have 100 billion, women have 80 billion. And one of the great mysteries of modern neuroscience is what men do with the extra 20 billion. So we have 100, uh, 100 billion neurons in the brain. These are the basic processing units. They, they are the, they're the living sort of microchips, if you will, that constitute our brain. Each, uh, each neuron has uh, millions of connections. So in fact, there are 100 trillion synapses or connections between neurons in the brain. That is more stars than are known to exist in the universe. That's just in one single human brain. Neurons are cells. They have a cell body with a nucleus, just like any other cell in the body. Um, they have uh, dendrites, which uh, integrate information from other neurons that are communicating with them. They have an axon that sends information, that integrated uh, information, uh, to other neurons in the brain. And uh, um, uh, Neurons have this very interesting property that they, their membrane potential, the charge across the membrane, is very tightly regulated. Uh, and then they have the capacity, kind of like a switch, to suddenly depolarize. So there's a flux of ions into the neurons that happens suddenly, a rapid depolarization. And that um, is then conducted down these axons. And that's how a neuron integrates activity and then fires to talk to other neurons across the brain. 
when these neurons talk to one another, they do it in different ways, but they, uh, the main way they do it is through synapses. These are little connections between the axon of one neuron and the dendrite of another neuron. And typically, a synapse consists of these vesicles of neurotransmitters and then little receptors on the postsynaptic membrane. And when a neuron depolarizes, it releases its neurotransmitter. The neurotransmitter connects up with these receptors. And it can do a number of different things. It can very rapidly change electri electrical activity across that membrane itself through ion channels. Or it can change the functioning of a neuron in a slower and more integrated kind of way. So all of this is going on from one cell to the next in the brain. Neurons aren't randomly present in the brain. Um, if you look at the sheet of cortex, uh, the sheet of, of, uh, of gray matter, which is known as the cerebral cortex, this is this folded up thing. If you were to unfold it, it would be about double sized. Um, it's folded up so you could fit more of it into your head. And quite remarkably, um, the neurons are organized in a highly organized way within layers and columns within this gray matter. So I'm kind of showing you a highlighted area. Um, neurons are organized in layers, and each of these layers has different patterns of connections. It's very systematic, uh, um, with sort of more inputs here, more outputs down the bottom here, the deeper layers. Um, and in addition, the neurons are organized in a very fancy lattice, where you've got the pyramidal cells, which are the majority of the neurons. And these are the ones that fire. These are excitatory. Um, and then you've got these little inhibitory interneurons that are wired up within very beautiful little lattice-like networks. And they provide the inhibition. And they control the timing of the firing of populations of neurons. So this kind of defines a kind of local circuit that exists within the larger circuitry of the brain. One of the key things about the brain is that it's not just organized in terms of topography or form. Um, uh, it's also organized in terms of its temporal dynamics. And so neurons can actually fire in a whole range of different frequency ranges, and they do. And, um, uh, here's an example of, and sometimes populations will fire at different times from one another, but often they're firing together synchronously. So here's an example of a little pop, uh, local circuit that's kind of firing more randomly. And here is a network that's at work. The neurons are firing together. And in fact, they're, they're, they're getting inputs. And then the timing of their firing is being regulated by those little interneurons that I showed you. So at the local circuit level, there's a tremendous amount of organization, a balance between excitation and inhibition. And these circuits are firing in a coherent way according to the particular demands for information processing that are uh, present in the brain. In addition to all this organization at the cellular and local level, the brain has to organize itself also at what we call the distributed network level. So when someone is doing a simple attention, so um, in, although uh, there are neurons and they're organized in sheets of neurons across the brain, different areas of the cortex are specialized to do different things. For instance, the back of the brain is specialized to represent visual information. And when someone's doing a simple visual attention task, sets such as, you know, see the red circle in a, in a bunch of blue squares, then there's a very simple connectivity, a fairly localized circuit at the back of the brain. The parietal cortex talks to the visual cortex. And it helps you select that information that's coming in and being represented in the back of the brain according to those simple task demands. But if it's more complicated, if you've got distractors in there as well, so um, you've got red, sca red, red squares and blue circles and red circles, and you have to look for the red circle. You can't just do it by color. You have to combine shape and, um, and form. Then other areas uh, get recruited, areas from the frontal lobes that are involved in actually doing a more complicated attention task and filtering out distractions. Same with memory. If you're just learning something simple, like a list of words, um, there are those attention areas in the back of the brain that are active. There are areas in the medial temporal lobes, uh, the hippocampus, the parahippocampus that are active. And then some areas in the frontal cortex that may be involved in um, helping you to select you know, a particular word that you're supposed to learn. But if you're learning um, something more complicated, such as the relationship between items, or there's a lot of distraction, then you'll have to bring on some of those same frontal areas that do the uh, attention control. And and use them to help support memory. So there are these distributed circuits that are very much shaped by the particular context and demand in which your brain is thinking. And so just very simply, um, this organization both in space and in time um, across multiple levels, from the cellular to the microcircuit 
um, to the region of the brain. Uh, the, uh, in order to do a complex task, the brain has to organize itself into macro circuits. In order for these local circuits, these regions to work right, you have to have those oscillations in place. Neurons have to be firing in precise timing in relationship with one another. And then what's really interesting is that there seem to be certain frequencies that actually, and this, is, this was one of the points in the article that Dr. Myers was talking about, actually entrain across these networks and help bring those networks together and get them to work in a task appropriate way. And if someone has injury to any one of these nodes, you're going to see changes in the way that network functions, and you start, you're going to start to see problems when people have to actually do cognitive tasks of different kinds, whether they have to pay attention or they have to remember. And if uh, elements such as changes in the local circuits or changes in the connections between neurons or neurons and interneurons happens, then you're going to get disruption of the timing. And that's going to affect the ability of these local areas to do their job. And it's also going to affect your ability to pull together these more distributed networks to do more complicated things. And that breakdown can be associated with Disorganized, disorganized behavior. Um, that's something that we see in ADHD, in autism, and schizophrenia. And um, it's kind of not surprising. What is more surprising to me is that these 100 billion neurons with their 100 trillion connections and their need to fire in precise temporal relationship to one another and to be drawn together in distributed networks across the brain in order to do even the more simple things in life actually work. It's miraculous. And it's not surprising that there is actually a whole range of individual differences in the degree to which it works. And also that many things that can perturb the development of these networks can have an impact and cause what, we, what we, we consider to be the common mental disorders and developmental disorders. How do we know all this stuff? Um, a lot of it we knew when I was a medical student back in the 1970s, um, but a lot of it we didn't know. And uh, oh, even during the past 10 or 15 years, um, we have gotten access to some amazing tools that have really revolutionized um, what we know and, and led us closer to this kind of general understanding, but also, I think, to a much more fine-grained understanding about how the brain works. And I thought I'd tell you about just a few of these. Um, these are tools that allow us to image the structure of the brain, to image the function of the brain, and to control the, and, and regulate the function of the brain. And in fact, to regulate it and to read it out and to re-regulate it in a way that's quite unprecedented. So one of the things that we can do is we can image the brain now at incredible detail. So this is a, a very small uh, one millimeter piece of the cortex that I showed you earlier. And uh, in that, um, electron uh, uh, microscopic uh, sections have been re uh, acquired. And then using computer-based software, a three-dimensional reconstruction has been made of that tiny little area. This is the sort of thing that probably took a graduate student. We have a couple of graduate students in here doing systems neuroscience. And it probably took them their whole thesis, staring at a computer and reconstructing these images. Um, but this is a beautiful image, which makes an amazing point. Um, when I learned about the organization of the brain and how cells are organized, um, it, it, never, it always seemed to me like in all those figures there was space, right? There was fluid and there were like gaps between things. And it's pretty clear that there's no space in here. Everything's packed in. Um, uh, the, the filling, the connections and the cells pretty much take every little imaginable piece of space. And, and um, this is the 100 uh, uh, billion microprocessors as they're really organized in those lattices and networks uh, doing their job, packed in. Um, so so um, this is one particular approach um, that is, I think, rapidly developing. We're developing. We still can only look at like a millimeter or a few millimeters um, in three dimensions. But I think over the next decade, there are all these tools being developed. I'll talk a little bit about the brain initiative in a little while. That are going to really one day, um, somehow, if we can ever figure out how to visualize it, give us um, an image of the entire brain and its rich connectivity like this. This is one of the big science aims, and I think something that's going to happen in the next several years. It's also possible to image those connections using remarkable levels of uh, super resolution. So this is a technique called two-photon microscopy. Um, as Dr. Myers knows, everyone needs a two-photon microscope. Isn't that right? And we have quite a few of them here on campus. And uh, they're not cheap. Um, but um, but uh, so here are a couple of uh, dendrites of a neuron. So those are the, that's a part of the neuron that's kind of getting inputs from other neurons. And they have these little spines on them that you can see. 
And these are the spines that have the individual synapses on them. And it's possible to image this both in living tissues and in non-living preparations. Um, I'll show you one of our pilot uh, grants um, that is doing some very dynamic imaging using this technique. It's possible to see how they change as an animal learns. And this is what's going on in our brain. Um, those synapses with their neurotransmitters and their receptors, that's how the neurons are talking to one another. But it's not a fixed structure. It's constantly changing. It's dynamic. And the neurons that uh, uh, fire together wire together. Um, and, um, and this is the principle of neuroplasticity, that as we learn, our brain changes its structure, it changes its connections. And that's not permanent. These things are always constantly uh, being uh, cycled and recycled. Um, and so, yeah, we like to think of our brain as a solid mass of tissue, but actually it's kind of a mush of things that are constantly, it's a very organic living thing that's constantly changing and remarkably serving as the, those connections and those changes serve as the, as the basis of our knowledge of the world and our ability to represent the world and the ability of us to regulate our behavior. Other things that we can do are MRI imaging. Uh, uh, Dean Myers talked about uh, the imaging center um, that we have across the street. Uh, it's certainly very straightforward, both clinically and for research, to make beautiful uh, three-dimensional images of the brain and then to quantitatively uh, measure it uh, in different ways. There's quite a few people like Julie Schweitzer in here who do this for a living. Um, we can take the MRI scanner and we can tune it to be sensitive to changes in blood flow. As your brain works harder, it, you, it increases its blood flow. And so uh, this is uh, the visual cortex, that back part of the brain that's representing the visual world. And this particular person is uh, doing a visual task and uh, showing it increase the blood flow in that visual cortex. Um, and uh, with elegant experiments, you can tease apart the function of different circuits and how they talk to one another and how they're necessary or not necessary in relationship to all sorts of things that uh, make up our mental life. Everything from attention and memory to daydreaming and fantasizing and uh, responding emotionally. Um, this is something called clarity. So this is a mouse brain. And um, this is one of two examples I'll show you of uh, technology uh, for which we can thank uh, a colleague of ours at Stanford University, Carl Dasroth. I'm proud to say that he's a psychiatrist. Every Friday he sees patients. Um, he sees uh, uh, young adults with autism spectrum disorders. And in his spare time, or maybe in his day job, um, he develops miraculous tools. And so this is Clarity. What it does is it allows you to wash out all of the color that's present in the brain while maintaining its structure, structural integrity. And so then you can fold in some, uh, some dyes, and, uh, and that allows you to basically look right through the brain to see the three-dimensional structure of the brain at all levels of um, resolution, from the gross brain to focused right in on very high-resolution high uh, imaging of its cells. Uh, this is something that's uh, really amazing. It's really revolutionizing our understanding of brain anatomy. And it's just one of these many amazing things that if you had said, maybe so Jackie Crowley, who's a very distinguished neuroscientist sitting in the audience, 10 years ago, would you have believed that we would be using detergent to wash out the color um, in, uh, in brains and look right through it? It's incredible. We would have thought it was science fiction. Um, in addition to looking at the brain um, and studying its organization and structure, it's possible to record from the brain. One can record from single neurons or populations of neurons. Uh, you can do it in a, in a behaving animal. Um, you can do it in human beings, too, so long as they're already having their skulls opened and they're undergoing a neurosurgical procedure. Um, and it's possible, again, to look to record from uh, large population, single neurons, uh, um, uh, multiple neurons. Um, uh, Evan Evangelatis is sitting in the back, and he's one of these people who does this kind of recording. Um, uh, you can do it in multiple areas of the brain so that you can record from networks. Um, and as I said, you can do this in the human brain as well. This is called ECOG. And uh, we're getting an enormous amount of information about how neuronal populations work together to support basic human cognitive functions, such as memory and attention and the like, through this method. And then um, this is another Dyseroth um, uh, invention. Um, uh, a number of years ago, uh, uh, Dr. Dyseroth figured out that you could genetically modify animals. You could put 
uh, what are called channel reduction, reductions, which are um, ion channels that are responsive to specific frequencies of light. And through your genetic engineering tools, you can label particular groups of neurons in the brain, either in one part of the brain or a population. You can label the interneurons, the inhibitory cells, or the excitatory cells. And then you can put a little laser in there and you can turn the, a little fiber optic, I should say, and you can turn the light on and off and you can control the activity of those neurons. You actually control the flow of ions in and out of those neurons and you can make them fire, you can make them stop firing, uh, you can make them fire at a certain frequency. And uh, again, it's now possible to both record from and stimulate actual neurons in very specific parts of the brain. And uh, that's allowing us to, uh, to uh, learn remarkable things. You can actually train an animal if you put uh, these, um, uh, if you put the channel reduction, reduction in the, uh, the dopamine areas of the brain, the reward areas of the brain, you can actually teach an animal to do a task or to learn a maze in the way that um, Dr. Crowley would need to use chocolate chips for. You can just do it with light. So an amazing tool. And I, I give you those examples. I could give you a whole talk about this. Um, if, uh, a big part of the Brain Initiative is to take tools like this that are actually widely used in neuroscience now. They're not even, for those of the neuroscientists, they're probably not even particularly novel or exciting. But I'm hoping to those of you that aren't neuroscientists, you see the incredible opportunities that these tools open for us in terms of really asking very basic questions about how the brain works. Um, and there are many, many more of these coming along um, every few months now. And the Human Brain Initiative is a largely, uh, the Obama Brain Initiative is largely focused on kind of promoting the development of these tools right now. All right, so let's get to the Behavioral Health Center. So the history, many trips downtown <laughs> with Dean Myers and, and Dr. Hales and Christy, um, uh, meeting with uh, 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 then Senator Steinberg staff because he wanted to do something that would uh, last longer than his term um, in, in the Senate, as if he needed to do anything more than the many things he's done. Um, and uh, he wanted to, uh, to do something that would bring research to Prop 63. Um, he felt that Prop 63, in terms of funding uh, many uh, innovative clinical programs, was off to a really good start. Um, but he felt that the thing that was missing was research. And so he talked to us and to our siblings at uh, UCLA. And eventually, this led to uh, the Behavioral Health Center of Excellence that started, well, it started in October. It's hard to know when it started. It started a couple of years before that, really. Um, and um, and uh, um, $15 million was appropriated to these centers. So $7.5 million to UC Davis and $7.5 million to, um, to UCLA. And the vision was for us to bridge basic and clinical neuroscience and behavioral research to treatment and services research and to do it in a way that would inform policy and to some degree that would be informed by policy. Um, and the organization of the core, well, there is an administrative core, so that's Dean Myers and Christy Truchon and myself. Um, but there's also one of the things we did with the center was to invest in an evaluations and outcomes core. And we were able to help the Department of Psychiatry and CHIPR, uh, which is the Center for Health Policy and Research. I'm sorry, I still have trouble remembering that acronym. Um, uh, so we have a center that's very policy oriented um, to and um, to help. We, one of the things we did was we helped them to recruit a, uh, a, a health economist from the University of Toronto, Carolyn Dua, who is, I think, visiting and house hunting right now and will be joining us in a few months. She'll be a faculty in the Department of Psychiatry located at Chipper. And she will lead this evaluations and outcomes core. And we see this as being um, a resource certainly for the university and for our faculty um, as they develop their research, but also a statewide research to really ask questions like, what is the impact, the economic impact, of um, new uh, programs that have been funded by Prop 63? Um, is this intervention uh, in young adults with autism um, having uh, a, an impact across the range of uh, areas that we would care about, clinical symptoms, functioning, and also costs? Um, I think when you're working with policymakers, being able to address that cost issue in a rigorous way is obviously something very important and it's something that we hope to really enhance our ability to do here at UC Davis and put us in the position of providing real leadership at the state and national level. Um, 
The other core that I uh, wanted to mention is the policy core, and that's the core that Daryl leads. And um, in that core, uh, we are doing a, a number of things. There are some training opportunities that uh, um, Department of Psychiatry trainees, um, some undergraduates on campus are taking advantage of, some new uh, uh, internships and educational opportunities. And in the coming year, we also plan to focus on um, a, an area that is a high priority both to uh, Senator Steinberg and also to our chancellor, which is student mental health, which as you all know, uh, college student mental health is a huge challenge nationally. And our college students um, are under a tremendous amount of stress and many of them um, uh, have succeeded in going to college uh, because of the, they, although they have disabilities, they were given uh, support and help um, uh, uh, whilst they were in high school school and we don't necessarily have, we're not able to necessarily provide those supports when they go to college so there's tremendous stress. Um, we also have many international students where there are complex cultural issues and providing them with mental health as well. So um, this is this is really hot off the press as a as a new um, and developing priority that the policy core is going to focus on in the coming year. Um, all right and so here's our team um, and uh, the other thing that we did um, with the uh, funds that we got from the state. And let me say, first of all, um, that we had to spend these monies. We only have three years. We're funded for three years. We have seven and a half million. That's the good news. The bad news is we have to spend it wisely uh, or it will go back to the state after three years. So um, after a lot of thought and discussion, um, we decided that one of the things that we really wanted to do was to jumpstart mental health research at UC Davis and to bring together the critical mass of people who are working in this area from, from all levels from very basic science and discovery all the way through to the clinical researchers and the policy makers. Um, you know, unlike many places, um, our mental health researchers are spread out across many departments and many colleges, and we really wanted to bring people together to jumpstart their research and to start a, a build a kind of critical mass of people who were talking to one another across many levels of analysis. So um, hence the pilot research awards, and there were two that I would like to tell you about and give you some examples. And you know, I forgot to say something at the beginning. Um, hi, Kat. It's good to see you. Thank you for coming. Um, I want to encourage you to stop me and ask questions. This isn't really meant to be, um, you know, David Letterman style monologue. I really do want you to kind of have a conversation with you. So um, if at any point along the way you have a question, just put your hand up. Sorry I didn't say this earlier. Um, all right, so the, there were two pilot programs that we supported. One was the um, sort of School of Medicine Pilot Awards, and then the second was the Brainstem Awards. Um, the School of Medicine Pilot Awards um, were offered at $100,000 a year for two years. That's a significant amount of funding if you're building a new study. Um, it's not enough to do any kind of study, but it will get you started. And it'll get you started along the path to the point where you're going to have the kind of preliminary results that you need to go to another agency, to the National Institute of Health, to a foundation, to um, PCORI and other places, and get additional research to kind of move the field along and to move the project along. And um, we uh, uh, did this in a um, very systematic way. Um, we put out a request for applications. Again, we made it clear we're looking at the whole range from very basic science and discovery and method development all the way through to clinical research, human imaging studies, services research, big data mining, um, and, uh, and um, we got 65 applications, which was a little bit of a surprise. We were quite expecting that many. And they were good. We um, uh, arranged to have them peer reviewed by leaders in the field. I called in all my chips with all my friends around the country uh, and got them to agree to review a few grants for us. Um, uh, so these were department chairs, journal editors, uh, leading scientists, the people who sit on the National Institute of Health study sections. And so they, they conducted the reviews for us. Um, and we were able to fund 16, which is about a third. And that's a bit better right now than the one in 10 odds that you have for going for an NIH grant. Um, and they were fantastic projects. And it was actually really easy to make the cut point. There, um, there were projects that really needed more development and more work. And there were these 16 that the reviewers said, this is ready to go. Um, and uh, some of those. Some of those awardees are here in the audience, Julie Schweitzer and Evan are here. 
um, which I thank them for. And uh, one of the things I wanted to do was to tell you a little bit about a few of those studies, just to give you a little feel. I can't go over all 16. I'm proud of these studies, but I, you know, you'd be here at 8 o'clock and you'd be throwing things at me. So. So I'll just tell you about a few of them. So I did mention that we, we cut across many areas. So um, uh, uh, one of these studies, I'll tell you in a little bit more detail, uh, involves the use of uh, direct current stimulation to enhance cognition. Dr. Myers talked about cognitive deficits. They're a common problem in people with schizophrenia. They're a common problem in people with autism. They're common in bipolar disorder and severe depression. There are many disorders where these cognitive deficits kind of converge. and. Uh, I'll tell you about uh, two studies, actually. One I'll talk mostly about is Dr. Evangelata's study, um, uh, 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 doing some really groundbreaking work to come up with some very new ways of dealing with this, which, which is important because we really don't, for most of the disorders except ADHD, we don't have precognitive drugs. Um, I'll talk about uh, some basic science studies, um, including one that's a little bit related to this uh, electrical brain stimulation that's related to the use of ultrasound for deep brain stimulation. Um, and also one from Karen Zito and Lin Tien uh, that's developing some new tools that are pretty amazing. Um, uh, we, did a, we, we did fund a single big data um, uh, project that was going to do some serious uh, data mining to, uh, and, and develop some new techniques for doing that um, that can form uh, that can inform long-term uh, healthcare utilization and various comorbidities, and that was an autism-related um, research project. And then I'll show you uh, a project from my colleague Taryn Indom that uses uh, smartphone technology and personalized health apps to really change the way we deliver uh, mental health care to youth with serious mental illness. Um, any of you that have children or grandchildren will know that they're never separated from their smartphone at any time, day or night. So if you want to engage them in treatment, this is a really good way to do it. OK, so um, the second group of studies, and this was a, a more limited um, uh, pilot program that we participated in. This was a partnership with Harris Lewin, who's our uh, vice chancellor for research on the campus. And uh, we persuaded him to join forces with us. And we went 50-50. So we got to leverage some of his funds, and he got to leverage some of ours um, uh, uh, to create some awards that were specifically targeted to the Obama Brain Initiative. So I think most of you are probably, have probably heard about this initiative that was announced about a year and a half ago. Um, this came out of the White House. Uh, the, um, the metaphor was the, the, moon, the moon shot. Um, the grand challenge uh, of the Obama presidency to try to understand how the human brain works and how to use that knowledge to cure brain disorders. And um, uh, a part of the brain initiative has been the, commit, the, uh, the committal of some additional funds. There's probably $100, $200 million of additional funds um, that have been committed by a variety of different agencies, including the NIMH, the Department of Defense, uh, and some foundations. And the real goal, if you talk to Tom Insel, who's the director of the NIMH is for the first five years, it's to develop the tools that we need to really understand the human brain. And so there's a big emphasis on method development and tool development, the kind of imaging, the kind of cellular recording, the kind of computational tools that we need to put all the information together and sort of visualize it and understand what's going on. Um, and then the next five years will be to take those tools and to use them to cure the brain disorders. That's the idea. And UC Davis actually has had a lot of success. Uh, there have been uh, several rounds of requests for applications from the NIMH uh, and from the National Science Foundation. And UC Davis has done really well. I think we were, we, we were the only people who, in both the first and second round, got two funded grants. Um, and, uh, and so what we wanted to do was to create some opportunities for um, some new projects to get created. And one of the things about the Brain Initiative that we also emphasized with our um, Behavioral Health Center pilots is that we were really looking for research that brought together investigators from different areas that, that, that were inherently interdisciplinary. And this is especially important for the Brain Initiative because one of the challenges that we have when we try to develop these tools is Basic neuroscientists and clinical neuroscientists don't necessarily have the training to develop tools. You actually need engineers and chemists and mathematicians and physicists. And so many of these te teams that were put together uh, for the brain initiative applications and for our brain stem consisted of these collaborations across different centers, across different departments, um, and across different disciplines. So I'll give you uh, a couple of examples of brain stem um, uh, 
I guess I'll do it now because I don't think I'm going into detail about these. So um, one of them involved actually using the principles of synaptic communication to build a new computer chip. And this was a collaboration that included um, uh, a, uh, uh, a computer scientist um, with very close relationships with Intel. Um, who's got access to their biologically um, informed chips that they're developing. And then um, another one um, was uh, for, for Marty Asri, um, basically looking at gene expression in the human primate uh, visual pathway in order to understand all the different kinds of cells. So I told you there's excitatory cells and inhibitory cells, and that's true, but that's an incredible simplification. There's dozens, probably hundreds of cellular phenotypes, all with different um, biophysical properties, all of which work together to make those networks that dance on and off according to a particular rhythm. And Dr. Usri is kind of pulling that all apart using molecular techniques and genetic techniques in order to just come up with the classification that we need to get all the cell types right in those wiring diagrams that I showed you. All right, so highlighter projects. Um, so I'm going to show you projects from Karen Zito and Lynn Tien, Lynn's not on there, um, from Evan Ancelatis, who is in the back row there and will be signing autographs at the end of the talk. Um, Kathy Ferrara, who is from our biomedical engineering department, and Tara Neander. And these are just examples. I just want to give you a little bit of a taste. Um, so Karen's project, let's just jump right to this. What Karen is doing, well, along with Lynn Tien, is developing some um, calcium sensors. These are basically um, uh, uh, molecules that turn on and off in the presence of different kind of light and um, can be inserted into neurons using a virus. And they can not just image the spines that I showed you early, earlier, but actually image very specific kinds of spines. So for instance, this is an example of uh, an image of uh, glutamate, um, glutamatergic spines. These are um, the, one of the um, kinds of neurotransmitters in the brain that, that, that communicates excitation. It's way, the way that one cell excites another. So uh, since um, uh, um, we have at least one psychiatrist in the audience, um, Cap, um, I, you know, uh, it's, it's possible Oh, sorry, and Bob, there's two psychiatrists in the audience. Um, it's possible to, oh, Mike, three, any more psychiatrists before I leave you out and insult you? Um, that's, my, that's the parietal cortex talking to the visual cortex, not quite right. So um, it's possible to actually then dissect out um, uh, changes in the density of spines that hold synapses in different classes, including glutamatergic, serotonergic, GABAergic. Um, so it takes that um, uh, high resolution two photon imaging that I talked to you about earlier and just takes it to absolutely the next level. And, and this will be done in animals initially in an epilepsy model. So as the circuits of epilepsy fire, um, this group will be able to image the changes in the glutamatergic uh, connections of neurons that um, occurs and results in a miswired circuit that makes the epilepsy worse. And then ultimately, it'll be able to be done in animals learning. Uh, recording from the circuitry that's involved in, in support of learning so that we can see the cells that fire together, wire together, um, down to the level of the kind of synapses that they're using to talk to one another. I think Dr. Myers alluded um, early in, uh, in his introduction to the fact that, you know, we've relied a lot on drugs over the years to uh, treat mental disorders. And... Um, uh, the last 10 years has been pretty disappointing for those of us that, uh, that rely on, on, on those drugs because there really haven't been any new ones. Um, and many of the companies that make drugs have stopped really doing research in the area of CNS. It's too risky. It's too expensive. Um, and so, uh, you know, there is a sense of frustration um, that, that is in conflict with the reality that we've learned so much about how the brain works and why can't we use it? And I think there's a growing awareness that actually we can. The brain isn't that far away. Actually, it's, it's right in there. And um, it responds to the environment 
much more than you think. I mean, obviously, our, it's, our senses are responding to the environment, and our brain is responding to our senses. But actually, it's possible to change the brain. What we've lacked up until the last decade or so is understanding the circuitry, understanding its dynamics, understanding how it works. But we know that now. So can't we use that knowledge to help some of these broken circuits? And I think the answer is it's becoming fairly clear that we can. So this is a technique called transcranial direct current stimulation, or TDCS. Has anybody heard of this? Yep. And um, if you haven't, just you, does anybody not have YouTube? Just go to YouTube. Type in TDCS. You will see a 13-year-old kid show you how to build a TDCS rig out of a 12-volt battery and some electrode pads and use it to improve his computer game skills. You will see it online. It's not actually a good idea that 12 and 13 year old kids are building this rig because we don't really know exactly how to make these systems work. They're out there. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of studies that have been done. So basically what this involves is putting a very small amount of electric current on the skull typically one to two milliamps, tiny, tiny, harmless. Uh, you get a little tingling if you get anything at all. And what, you, what people didn't realize, although they should have, because some stuff had been done maybe 40 or 50 years ago doing this, is that that current doesn't just sit on your skull. It goes through your skull. It goes into your brain. And it actually travels down those columns. Um, and it changes the excitability of neurons. Um, so you can, if it's a, a, a cathodal current, it'll, it'll push the neurons further away from firing. If it's an anodal current, it'll push the neurons closer to firing. If you have somebody uh, do a task and it generates an oscillation in a particular frequency, the, the, the intensity of that oscillation becomes increased. And that's exciting because it's through that neural activity that the circuits wire together and that you can establish normal patterns of connectivity in the brain. And so we know that under some circumstances, you can improve the ability of somebody to perform on a particular cognitive task using this approach. But we don't really know what the parameters are. We don't know where we should stimulate. We don't know how. That's where the science is right now, is figuring all of that. The 12-year-olds and the 13-year-olds, they don't care. They just want to get better at the world of Warcraft. Um, and there are quite a few companies, actually, that have decided they're not going to go the evidence-based FDA route. And you can go online, and you can buy your TDCS um, stimulator for two or three hundred dollars. It's much nicer than the 12-volt version. It's more like this. Um, and so uh, here at UC Davis, uh, there's a serious effort to take this technology and to first of all try to understand what it does and how it works. And then second of all, um, to see if we can um, optimize it and use it for treating human cognitive disorders, including we do have a protocol that we haven't started to improve cognition in people with schizophrenia. And uh, um, uh, Charan Ranganath, who's a researcher at the a memory researcher at the Center for Neuroscience, and now Evan, uh, um, who uh, who is collaborating with Charan and does recording studies in awake behaving non-human primates, um, have two projects between them. Uh, the first uh, that I'll describe of Evans is uh, basically to try to figure out what's, what, the, what this stimulation is doing, where it's going in the brain, how it's affecting brain rhythms, how we might be able to read it out in humans, because we obviously can't record directly from people's brains typically in humans. And then Dr. Ranganath, and I have a little hand in this, this other study, um, is actually taking this. Um, we've already managed to show that we can make uh, UC Davis undergraduates smarter for an hour from a single treatment um, of two milliamps over the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex. Um, and that's actually pretty good because they're pretty smart to start with. Um, and uh, we do plan to eventually to take this into patients informed by the information that we'll get from it, Dr. Angelatis' study. So actually, uh, just to keep going because I realize I'm using up all my time here. Um, basically, uh, Evan, you can correct me for all my mistakes. It's so scary to describe somebody's research project and have them sitting right there in the audience. Um, essentially, what Evan is going to do, he He's going to do TDCS. In, um, it can be anodal or cathodal. Um, and he's going to record from the brain, and he's going to record EEG. And he's going to figure out where those electrons go, how they affect neural activity, how that is related to improvement on a learning task. And that's, that's Evan's expertise, is in uh, uh, frontal striatal circuits that support different kinds of learning. Um, and also how that neural activity is related to things that we can record on the scalp in humans um, that can be a potential readout. 
Um, and uh, he will explore different parameters um, and uh, hopefully give us more of a kind of detailed and reliable roadmap that will allow us to then do human studies directly seeking without five years or 10 years of an effort uh, by a pharmaceutical company to, uh, to improve cognition in schizophrenia, something no drug has ever been able to do so far. And this will have relevance to ADHD, uh, to autism, probably to depression, other disorders. Um, someone actually once made the um, uh, analogy that um, perhaps in psychiatry we're at a point where cardiology was um, in the past, where cardiology was all about drugs for arrhythmias, and now it's all about just using electricity, actually. You know, and actually give drugs for most of the arrhythmias, just give a little tweak of electricity. So it may sound a little crazy in science fiction, but so did optogenetics and so did clarity just a few years ago. So I think we have to be open to the fact that we might be going in a new direction. All right, um, now, one of the challenges with TD TDCS and related kinds of neurostimulation is that mostly they focus on the cortex. Now, it's possible that TDCS goes much deeper than that, and Evan's gonna be looking at that. Um, but um, you are probably aware that for certain severe neurological disorders, as well as severe forms of depression and OCD, um, there's a procedure called um, uh, deep brain stimulation where uh, the circuits that are involved in regulating motor activity or regulating mood are stimulated directly. These are people who have just not responded to any medication treatment or you know, uh, uh, other forms of treatment, and they have electrodes. And for Parkinson's, it's a miracle. You turn the electrode on, and you turn the, the stimulation on, and people's tremors uh, go away, at least for, for a substantial amount of time. Um, this, this is done in depression, and it is done in OCD, but it's very invasive. It's never going to become a widely practiced treatment. Um, but if we had another way of getting to those deep brain structures that was not invasive, well, we would be really interested in using it. And Kathy Ferrara, who's an amazing bioengineer, um, she's a member of the National Academy of, uh, of Engineering. Uh, she's a brilliant um, uh, engineer who's also interested in brain health, basically uh, has an experiment. Um, uh, and there are other people working on this as well, using ultrasound to go deep into the brain and to stimulate key structures um, and this is in many ways quite similar to, uh, to Evan's study, but this is going to be done in rodents. And instead of directly recording neural activity, she's going to use the MRI scanner and uh, the bold response to read out changes in the deep brain that are uh, being uh, stimulated using ultrasound in a very highly anatomically constrained way. And so the idea here is that for some disorders, and they might be neurological ones or they might be psychiatric ones, where you have to get into these deep limbic structures um, that are not accessible through electrical stimulation or magnetic stimulation or other kinds of stimulation, you might be able to get there using ultrasound. So there's a theme here on technology, and actually I'm going to end on that. It's not that we only do tech here at UC Davis, but health technology is a big strength, and uh, we're just building on our strengths. So the last project that I'll tell you about is a cool one. Um, I showed you a picture of Tara Neendam earlier. Um, this is a study that was funded by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation and involved a partnership uh, with a uh, startup company. And essentially what this is about is, um, let me go back. Um, it's about uh, using a smartphone app as an add-on tool. Basically, this is an app that goes on your smartphone. If you don't have one and you're in the study, we give you a phone. That's a big incentive for these guys. Um, and then we do two things. We do passive monitoring of things like sleep, number of phone calls, number of texts, um, activity, overall level of activity. And then we actually have them fill out um, several times a day ratings. How are you feeling? Have you been having uh, conflicts? Um, are you taking your medication? Um, and then we do all sorts of other stuff as well. So we relate that to things we can measure in the laboratory. And, and then what we also do is we have a real-time dashboard on the clinician's desktop that provides them with real-time information about all of these things, plus alerts. So if the person says they feel suicidal, there's an alert on the dashboard. If a person says they didn't take their medicine or they're not going to take their medicine, there's an alert that appears on the dashboard. Um, more than a number of times, this has had a dramatic impact on clinical care. Um, Tara's interested, so the main purpose of this study was actually feasibility. Can you take young people? And if you don't know about our clinic, our clinic is for young people with psychosis. So these are period people who are paranoid. Some of them are afraid um, of the internet. 
uh, it was a big question as to whether these young people would be willing to participate in a study like this. And I think what we've found is not only are they willing, they really, really like it and they want to keep use, doing it after the study is over. And they're much more honest with their phone than they are with their doctor. Um, so uh, very interesting kind of new direction. Again, it's kind of tech, um, but I think very exciting and very innovative. And uh, we funded, Dr. Nian have already had this started up, but we funded an expansion into a couple of the neighboring uh, counties and um, also an expansion of the kinds of things that she's measuring in the hope that we can kind of add this new dimension to, um, to mental health care. So there's this idea right now, if you've used it, some of you are probably wearing your Fitbit. I have mine on. Uh, I've, I really like the Fitbit. It's been really cool. They call this the quantified self. And uh, this is the quantified self in, in mental health treatments, is a quantified mental health treatment, something that's really been missing from our field. OK, so oh, all right. I don't know if I have time. We have to finish, Fred. I'm going to skip. I'll just tell you. Um, I'll just tell you about the Conti Center. I'll skip through. These are all the things we know about schizophrenia. Maybe I can give you another talk one day. Um, and then these are the reasons for doing this interesting study. Um, boy, let's just go here. So um, we are excited um, that uh, UC Davis uh, was awarded uh, a $10 million grant from the National Institute of Mental Health. And so Jackie Crowley is here. She's a part of that grant. Um, the grant um, is uh, called a Conti Center. Uh, it's very competitive. There's maybe 12 up to 15 of these at any one point in time anywhere in the country. Um, uh, you only let her renew it once, so you can have it for a maximum of 10 years. Um, and it's really for big science. It's like the flagship mechanism that the NIMH uh, uses to invest in big science, high risk, high gain research. And uh, we're testing a very radical theory about um, the molecular basis of schizophrenia. And that is that at least for some patients, there are molecules in the brain called cytokines, which in the periphery are involved in fighting off germs and in the brain do something completely different. They're involved in stabilizing those synapses and having them talk together in an effective way. And we know from animal models that if you um, uh, perturb the immune system of a pregnant animal and cause the cytokines in the mother to increase, that offspring will develop normally through childhood. And then when it reaches adolescence, it will get to be a peculiar animal, whether it's a mouse or another animal. And so um, that's, so what has it got to do with schizophrenia? How could that possibly have anything to do with schizophrenia? Well, there are many changes in the brains of those animals that are reminiscent of the things that we see in schizophrenia and some of their behaviors that are reminiscent. And also, um, let me ask you, what is the number one environmental risk factor for causing schizophrenia? Maternal infections, actually. Yeah, maternal infections. It's weird, because no one's really kind of understood this. And people used to think these cytokines weren't in the brain until about 10 years ago. Um, what's the number one most strongly associated gene to schizophrenia of the 108 genes that are associated with schizophrenia? What's the number one? It's called MHC, major histability complex. No one knew what that gene could have to do with schizophrenia, actually. you know. It's very much involved in individual differences in how these molecules respond to various kinds of uh, environmental perturbations. So, so this is a, a somewhat uh, risky uh, uh, project. We have uh, animal models. Uh, we're doing human imaging, um, measuring markers of inflammation in our young patients, and we do see evidence for it. Um, and uh, in those animal models, we're using some of the same kind of imaging. And uh, we actually see some very interesting things. I would have shown you if I had time. Uh, one of the things we see is that there is inflammation in the cortex of these grown-up non-human primates who are developing these behavioral problems um, and whose mothers were exposed to an immune stimulus. The other thing we're seeing is the, the same kinds of increased dopamine levels in the basal ganglia and parts of the brain that we see in patients when we do PET imaging. So it's very exciting. There's lots of novel. Uh, 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 findings, um, and uh, we're very excited to have these, this center at Davis because it can be a nexus, a nidus for growing other research programs. Um, and I uh, just wanted to tell you a little bit about it. So I should end so you can go home, although it's cooler here than it is outside. Um, I don't know, maybe my, maybe my remote 
also wants to stop. So I, I can just leave it there and I can thank you. And um, I'll let you know that uh, we've got some drinks and some food here in the back and that I'm happy to stick around for a little while and answer any questions that you might have. Um, or we can open the floor for questions now and people can kind of slip away as they would like. So um, thank you very much.